Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. You've got to do something about your wife, the pretty blonde sitting across from me at lunch said. I know, I said, taking a bite out of my salad. You know she's sleeping with Rolf again, don't you? She asked. The she in this case was April, my sister-in-law, who worked in my department. Rolf was not only my wife's current fling, he was also my boss. As you may have guessed by now, this wasn't the first affair between Rolf and my wife. The last time, I caught them in the act during a company Christmas party. I nearly killed the son of a witch then and backed off kicking Marcia to the curb when she swore it would never happen again. It's only sex, Larry, it didn't mean anything, she cried as we drove home. I still love you. Like an idiot, I believed her and stuck it out, thinking we could work it out with counseling. And it seemed to work for a few months anyway. But things were slowly going back to the way they were before. You know the drill, girls' nights out, Marcia staying out till all hours, coming home late smelling of stale cigarettes, beer and sex. All the while denying me even the tiniest bit of affection. And me, you ask. Who am I? My name is Larry Reynolds, chief engineer for a tech company specializing in surveillance gear. It was my job to oversee new designs for things like internet-capable micro cameras and the like. Our work was mostly classified and quite demanding. I met and married Marcia right out of college. There was something about her blonde hair, deep blue eyes and killer body that made me fall in love with her at first sight. She also had a playful personality and was always open to sex. For the first couple years, things were great. We screwed like rabbits and couldn't be happier with each other. Then I got promoted to my current position and it all went to hell. After my promotion, we decided that I made enough so that she wouldn't have to work. So, we bought a big house and prepared to expand our family. Unfortunately, Rolf, my new boss, was a real ballbuster who made my life hell, forcing me to work up to 60 hours a week. Worse yet, he was an arrogant, smug creep who thought he was God's gift to women. I'd heard from a number of my female colleagues at work about his actions and wondered why no one had filed a sexual harassment charge against him. Then there was that Christmas party. Marcia wore a tiny dress and Rolf picked up on it almost instantly, homing in on her like a guided cruise missile. A couple hours into the party, I looked for Marcia but couldn't find her. Someone told me he thought Marcia and Rolf had been seen heading to a conference room. After a half hour of searching, I found them. Marcia was on the table, her legs spread wide as Rolf pounded her with abandon. He simply looked at me as he came inside her. Get out of here, you pervert. I'm nearly done, then you can take her back home, he said with a smirk. Marcia just smiled at me, apparently not caring that she had just been caught in the act. Get your clothes back on, which, we're leaving, now, I told Marcia on my way out. Naturally, things were frosty at home for quite some time. Rolf cornered me the next day at work and threatened to fire me if I said anything to HR. I didn't want to risk my job, so I didn't respond the way I wanted to. But that doesn't mean I didn't do anything. So, what are you going to do? April asked, forcing me back to the current reality. Are you going to divorce her? And what are you going to do about Rolf? Are you going to let them keep cucking you like that? You do know people are starting to notice. Yeah, I know people are talking. Unfortunately, divorce is out. As much as I'd like to divorce her, the truth is I'd lose everything, including the house, and I'd end up paying for her to keep screwing Rolf. That doesn't leave many other options, April said. She had a point. I could kill her. Hell, I'd even thought about killing her, but that would only get me thrown in prison for life. Or worse. Killing her was out of the question. Whatever you do, you need to do it fast. I'm not covering for her anymore and I'm really getting sick and tired of hearing her talk about how big Rolf is. God, this'll kill our folks. They think the sun rises and sets in her. I was getting sick of Marcia's crap also. I assured April before we ended our lunch that I had it covered and would deal with it soon. What no one knew is that I had spent the last few months preparing my revenge on both Marcia and Rolf just in case things went south again. Thanks to my job, I was able to get my hands on some top-notch surveillance gear. Internet-controlled high-def cameras throughout the house, GPS devices on her car, and cameras integrated into her dashboard and microphones in her purse. Yeah, I had it all covered, and it was paying off. The evidence was pretty self-explanatory. Rolf and Marcia got together almost every day, sometimes in our marital bed, other times in hotels around town. It was pretty clear they were in a long-term relationship and disrespected me every chance they could. One conversation, for example, included their desire for Rolf to get Marcia pregnant while passing off the child as mine, even making me pay for her medical expenses. I couldn't help but wonder what Rolf's wife would think of that. 
I also wondered what upper management would think of a mid-level manager blatantly violating their morals clause. I also took the time to get myself back in shape. I had turned a bit pudgy after my discharge from the Marines, so I decided to join a gym and took karate lessons to hone up my fighting skills. If Rolf wanted to fight, he'd be in for a surprise. But what about Marsha? There was no way I was going to let her get off the hook and I would clearly be the loser in a divorce. That's where Lopez came into my plans. I met him at the gym, and we later talked over a beer at a bar down the road. As it turned out, Lopez was an ex-con with quite a few shady connections. After letting me cry in my beer, the big black man put his hand on my shoulders. Look, man, this shit's killing you. I know how you feel, believe me. Killing her won't help. Trust me, I know firsthand. So, what do I do? I can't kill her, I can't divorce her, and I sure as hell can't live with her. Tell you what, let me make a couple calls. I've got some ideas that might fit the bill and you really don't need or want to know the details. Thanks, man. We spent the rest of the night in the bar, watching a game over beer. Marcia threw a fit when I staggered back in the house after midnight, but I was in no mood for her crap. Where have you been? A hole? You're drunk, she screamed. Screw you, which I yelled back. After all the shit you've put me through, I've earned a night out with my friends. So, get the hell away from me. Marcia jumped back at that. I had never spoken that way to her before. She backed off and didn't say anything else for the rest of the night. The next day, Marcia had one of her late nights. She claimed to be with the girls, but I knew better. She reeked of sex and it was obvious she had screwed Rolf. She stripped naked, climbed into bed and grabbed my hand. Touch me, she whispered. I pushed her away. God, you reek. And I refuse to touch you. And go take a shower. You smell like shit. Screw you, she said, turning away. I kicked her out of bed and told her if she insisted on smelling like a street 304 to go sleep in the guest bedroom. A couple days later, Lopez sent me a text, Africa Calls. He followed that up with, call if you want a reservation. Gotcha. Thanks, I texted back. I had suspicions but didn't say anything. I later got a call at work. It was Marsha. Can you get home a little early today? I have a surprise for you. I'll bet. Yeah. I think so, I said. Rolf hasn't been in today, so I can probably get out a bit early. What do you have in mind? Well, I realized I've been something of a witch to you lately, and I'd like to do something to fix that. Maybe a sexy, romantic weekend. Sounds good, I said. I'll see you this afternoon. Actually, I had already seen her, thanks to my internet-capable cameras. I also saw Rolf drilling her brains out in our bed, again. Showtime, I thought. I printed images from the video I had which included timestamps, and headed off to HR. I also sent an email to Dave Matthews, the CEO of our company, and to a few selected members of the board of directors. I also sent a copy to Rolf's wife. Eileen Jacobs, the HR director, wasn't happy when I showed up. I let her know in no uncertain terms that I was filing an official complaint against Rolf, and if his actions weren't dealt with immediately, I would take legal action against the company. I then headed up to see Dave. I walked straight past his assistant, who insisted I wait. Screw it, I'm going to see Mr. Matthews right now, I said, barging into his office. Dave Matthews was a big man, but he knew I had him and the company over a barrel. I want this piece of shit fired. If he's not fired, I'm suing. Period. End of sentence. Consider it done, he said. I thanked him and walked out. I got home about an hour later, noticing that Rolf's red Ferrari was still in our driveway. I pulled into the garage and grabbed my holstered Glock out of the glove box just in case I needed it. Securing the pistol on my belt, I made my way inside. Rolf was sitting on the couch, drinking one of my beers. As always, he had a smirk on his face. It took everything I had to shoot that smirk right through the wall. Renee came down the stairs, apparently from our bedroom. She was completely naked. Surprise, she said, smiling. What the hell is this? I asked, as if I didn't already know. I'm going to take a sexy, romantic holiday with Rolf for a few days, dear. And yes, I'm leaving just like this. Don't worry, it doesn't have anything to do with you. And no, I don't love him. I love you. It's just sex, right? I just want to have sex. Then I'll be back and we can pick up right where we left off. Maybe we can even have a baby and put all this behind us. I don't think so, I told her, grabbing her left hand. I yanked her rings off, which prompted Rolf to get off the couch. Get your hands off her, he said, taking a swing at my head. Wrong move. I let him get a glancing blow off my head just so I could claim self-defense and then let him have it. A punch to the throat, 
then a few kicks to the groin. A knee just happened to connect with his nose as he doubled over. I managed to kick and stomp on his balls a few times as he lay on the floor. Marsha was screaming throughout the whole incident. I grabbed Rolf's hair and put the barrel of the Glock in his mouth, making it clear that he was this close to death. His eyes opened wide as he no doubt saw the blinding hatred in mine. Get the hell out of my house and stay away from me and my wife. And if you ever screw with me again, I will kill you. Got it, A hole? He nodded his head, and I dragged him by the hair to the door and literally kicked him out of the house. He made his way to his Ferrari and drove away. I turned to Marcia, who was now bawling her eyes out on the floor. Shut the hell up, you good for nothing 304. I told her. She looked up at me with terror in her eyes. So you want a naked sex holiday, do you? I think I can arrange that. I pulled out my hone and called Lopez. When and where? I asked. He texted me an address, which happened to be a dock on the east side of town. Let's go. Which, I told Marcia, grabbing her by the arm. You've got a nice berth waiting for you. What are you talking about, Larry? Please don't do anything to me. It was only sex and I really do love you. It didn't mean anything. Shut the hell up. I've had it with you. Your lies, your cheating, and your disrespect. It ends. Now, are you going to kill me? She sobbed, looking at the Glock in my hand. No, you stupid witch, that's illegal. I've got something better in mind. And I think you'll even like it, I said sarcastically. At least let me get dressed, she begged. No, you were going to walk out of this house naked with Rolf, so you can go with me naked. Besides, you won't need any clothes where you're going. Where are you taking me? She asked. To your ride, dear, I said, dragging her naked to my car, throwing her into the front seat. And don't get any stupid ideas, I added, using the Glock for emphasis. About 30 minutes later, I pulled up to the address Lopez gave me. There was an old rusty steamer at the side of the dock. Several crew members watched as Lopez and another big man wearing what I thought was a captain's hat came over to the car. Marcia tried to cover her nakedness as Lopez opened her door. Don't worry, miss, no need to cover yourself here, the man with the hat said. Everyone here will get very familiar with you before you reach your destination, he added, laughing. Marcia looked at me, terrified. What are you doing? she asked. Are you really handing me over to them? And where am I going? No. Which? You gave yourself away a long time ago. I don't know where you'll end up, and I don't care anymore, but I suspect there'll be a lot of sex and drugs involved. Hell, maybe in a few months, you'll forget all about me, Rolf, and your boring housewife life. I know I'll forget all about you. Besides, it's only sex, right? Rolf ended up getting fired and his wife took him to the cleaners in her divorce. He didn't take it too well and decided to get revenge on me instead. I happened to be in the house when he broke in, and I just happened to have my Glock. The six bullets I put into his chest ensured he would never break into my house again. The police seemed to agree. I never really knew for certain where Marsha ended up, but I did read a story about a tramp steamer that was taken by Somali pirates off the coast of Africa. According to the story, authorities found the entire crew, which included a blonde American woman, dead, all victims of the pirates. And me? Well, April spent a lot of time consoling me. We spent a lot of time together and eventually got married. We're now expecting our third child. Life is good. Before you ask, yes, cops came to ask about my ex-wife. I told them she went out for a vacation. The next time they came was to inform me about her demise. Yes, I was a suspect, but they cleared me from the list. Now for the second story. I spent the last six months of my life troubleshooting a huge engineering project and should have been flying to San Diego to meet with the West Coast team. It had been almost three weeks since I had slept in my own bed and living out of a suitcase was taking a strain on my marriage. Then a miracle happened and I resolved all of our problems two weeks before the deadline. The client was so impressed they handed me a check for $50,000 my bonus for finishing early and told me to take a well-deserved vacation. They must have read my mind and handed me a first-class ticket home. This was the flight I had been dreaming of. I decided to surprise my beautiful wife Linda and not call first. I was counting the minutes until she would be in my arms. I had arranged for a limousine to take me home from the airport. As eager as I was to get home, I had him make a couple of stops. First, a florist where I bought two dozen long stem red roses. Our next stop was a liquor store where I picked up two bottles of their best champagne, a styrofoam cooler, and a bag of ice to chill the bubbly for our welcome home celebration. The driver offered to carry my luggage inside. Not wanting to spoil the surprise, I had him park a couple of doors away and stash my bags in the garage. I tipped him very nicely. 
As I walked up the front walk I tore open the florist paper and fanned out the roses out so they would block the peephole. I never used the front door and knew Linda wouldn't open it without checking to see who was out there. All she would see would be 24 of her favorite flower. I rang the bell. Linda opened the door dressed to the nines. You're early. She sounded excited. How did you know I love red roses? It took a moment for that comment to sink in. Since I brought you one on our first date, I said without thinking as I lowered the bouquet. Her eyes grew huge and she screamed when she saw me. It was not a good scream. All the color left her face. I could smell fear in the air. This is bad. Very bad. I thought. I dropped the roses. She did not move. We both stood frozen in silence, staring at each other. Linda looked like she had seen a glimpse of hell. I'm quite sure I looked the same. It was obvious what was happening. I don't know what held me back from grabbing her by the throat and strangling her. I felt sick. Linda spoke first. Her voice quivered with emotion as her mouth fought to form the words. I thought you were going to San Diego. It was at least a minute before I could answer. Who were you expecting? No one. She stammered. That lie exploded the reality of the situation to me. My wife was stepping out on our marriage. You must think I'm a total idiot. My voice filled the living room. If you want to have any chance of coming out of this still being married, you will confess everything before your date gets here. Linda passed out and hit the floor hard. I stood motionless staring at her prone body. Her skirt was up around her waist exposing her maidenly charms. I turned and threw up all over the living room couch. It wasn't much more than a minute later when there was a knock on the door. I looked through the peephole and saw a smarmy looking home wrecker in a cheap sport coat. He knocked again, this time with a bit more effort. I retrieved my gun from its hiding place in the buffet before I opened the door. I checked. It had six hollow point bullets in it. The stupid son of a witch actually walked into my house with an I'm here to screw your wife and there's nothing you can do to stop me grin. He made it all the way into the foyer before he saw me. I slammed the door behind him. I'll give him credit for being a quick thinker. Air, good afternoon Mr. Harris, he stammered. My name is Clemson, William Clemson. I'm with your homeowner's insurance company. He actually had the nerve to extend his hand as if he thought I would greet him as a friend. No, I greeted him like Jack Ruby greeted Lee Harvey Oswald. I shoved my .38 special in his gut and blew a big hole in my wife's lover. He crumbled to the floor. His blood began to stain my carpet. He looked terrified. For a second, maybe two, I was worried I had shot an innocent man. Then Linda screamed, You shot Bill. No shit. And I'm going to shoot you too. My wife ran to the kitchen and grabbed a towel. She got down on her knees and began to apply pressure. Please, call 911. You really don't get it, do you? Don't you remember what I did when I caught the punk that stole my lawnmower? You beat him half to death. And what makes you think I wouldn't kill the man who is stealing my wife? Linda actually got indignant. You don't own me. I ignored her stupid comment. So a hole? Are you married? I slapped his face to get his attention. Bill. His name is Bill. Linda shouted as though it mattered. So a hole, Bill? Are you married? When he didn't answer, I stepped on his fingers. He screamed like a girl. I pointed the gun in his face. I'm going through a divorce. His voice trembled. And what are the grounds? When he didn't answer, I placed my heel on his hand and began to apply pressure. I cheated on her. He shouted. Do you have any children? Two girls. And the woman you cheated with? She's also getting divorced. Does she have any children? She also has two girls. I looked at Linda. Three marriages destroyed because a whole Bill couldn't keep his pants sipped. She mumbled something about I didn't know. Other than on TV, I had never watched a man bleed to death. I don't know why I remembered, but they always called it exsanguination. The color was fading from his face to a sickly pale. Yeah, I would say he was dying. That means four children will grow up in broken homes because of your boyfriend. So a whole Bill, how many affairs did you have before your wife caught you? I tapped my foot on his hand. Three. No four. His breathing was becoming labored. Linda dropped the towel. You son of a witch. You said I was the only one. You said you loved me. She buried her face in her hands and began to sob. Look at this piece of shit. He's dressed like a used car salesman. And you destroyed our marriage to become just another notch on his tool. Well. Was he worth dying over? Bill began to cough up blood. I was tempted to put him out of his misery. He motioned me forward. He could barely speak. I thought he was going to beg for his life. Instead, he managed. Screw you and your 304 wife. It took all of my willpower not to end his suffering. Instead, I drew strength from it knowing what I had to do next. The entirety of my being was consumed by hate. 
Linda heard what he said and was curled up in a ball on the floor sobbing. It took almost five minutes before a whole bill went to wherever dead adulterers go. I walked over to my wife. It's your turn now. I pointed the gun at her. She began talking a mile a minute, begging me to let her live. Funny, she never said she was sorry she had stepped out on our marriage. No, she was too busy trying to get her death sentence commuted. If I don't kill you, I'll go to prison and you'll be free to screw every loser in town. No, no, I have an idea. You could call the police and we can say he was attacking me. You came home and rescued me. You'd be a hero. And how many people know you were screwing this piece of shit? Only Karen at the office. Karen, the one you call the gossip queen. How long would it take her to tell the police you two were lovers? Okay, then how about this? You could bury him in the woods. And while you're doing that, I would drive to the hardware store to rent a carpet cleaner. Like I would be stupid enough to let her drive anywhere. I patted the pistol in my pocket. No, she had died too. Please, Ronnie. I screwed up big time. But I promise I'll never do it again. Do you realize you have never once said you were sorry for betraying me, our marriage? Give me one reason why I shouldn't kill you. Linda wiped her nose on the sleeve of her silk blouse. Then she hugged me and gave me one of her crooked smiles that she knew I couldn't resist. Because I'll always love you. I looked her square in the eye and smiled back. The bullet screamed out of the gun at about 1,000 feet per second. Linda was dead before she felt anything. I caught her body so it wouldn't collapse to the floor. Her death was so sudden she was still smiling. I like to think the last thing she heard before waking up in eternity was me saying, and I'll always love you too. I carefully laid her down on the carpet then picked up the roses. I arranged them around what was left of her face. She looked like an angel. I spent the next couple of hours sitting next to Linda, telling her all the plans I had made on the flight home, a second honeymoon in Hawaii, anything she wanted. Every dream I had, we had, would never come to be. I had a couple of things I needed to do including writing a timeline for the police so they knew why I did what I did. I went upstairs and got a pair of panties out of Linda's dresser. I didn't want the police to see her undressed. Then I said a prayer and asked God to cut me a break. When I could think of no other reason to postpone the inevitable, I laid on the floor next to my wife. I held her hand as tight as I could and told her I was sorry. I kissed her goodbye and asked for her forgiveness. I didn't even feel the bullet tear through my brain. When your husband caused a double murder-suicide, you don't receive a lot of deepest sympathies cards. No, most of what Marie Clemson received were pretty nasty. More than a few blamed her for what happened. Some sadistic creep kept mailing her copies of newspaper stories with It's Your Fault scribbled across them with a red marker. After a couple of days, she began throwing all her mail, unopened, into a large cardboard box. The landlord's five-day eviction notice was delivered in person by a sheriff's deputy. She had nowhere to go and was terrified he would be back to take her daughters from her. Marie was going to dump the box in the dumpster, but decided to see if there was anything but bad news inside. One stood out, an envelope with her name and address written in perfect cursive penmanship. Curious, she slit the envelope open and pulled out a folded piece of paper. She almost collapsed in her chair when she opened it and saw it was a money order in the amount of $50,000 made payable to her. Now for the third story. Mistake an action or judgment that is misguided or wrong. I won't let you throw our marriage away because of one stupid mistake. Alicia, my soon-to-be-served wife, shouted, every word wavering as if she was moments away from emotional collapse. For a little under three hours, she had been randomly shifting between anger, sorrow, remorse, and obstinate delusion. Things had gotten old after the first twenty or so minutes, and I had left her in the living room to find her own way through the situation she had placed us in. Truth be told, she was looking rather haggard. Her eyes were puffy and red from over two hours of nearly nonstop crying while the rest of her face was mottled with red blotches from where she had either buried her head in her arms or pressed her hands to her face while she railed against the inevitable. Until that last sentence, I had curiously been rather detached. The righteous indignation with which I had announced my intent to divorce her had waned, leaving me somewhere between entertained and ambivalent where her tantrum was concerned. It wasn't even the sentence itself which returned me to a fit of pique. It was only one word. Mistake. Oh, I have no doubt you made a mistake. I spat, amazed at how quickly my mood returned to its previous state. But I'm certain it's not what you think it is. That got her attention as she raised her head to at last look me in the eye. The question was clear as day on her face. She had no clue what I was talking about. But I was finding myself on a roll and would take care of that for her straight away. You did make a mistake. Alicia, I reiterated, 
in that you decided that I either would not discover that you had a lover, would love you too much to ever leave you, or that you could somehow convince to overlook it all. Realistically, I discounted the first possibility, as the two of them had been fairly brazen in their actions. In fact, it had been my own sister who had clued me in that something was not right in my marriage after she had seen Alicia and her toy boy coming out of the Marriott Hotel downtown. If I were a betting man, I would place money on the last of my listed options that Alicia had somehow convinced herself that she could talk her way out of things, if ever her affair came to light. Everything else after your mistaken decision was not another mistake. Every last action was merely based upon that original mistake. Every time you met with your toy boy, every time you two screwed, every moment of plotting and planning that it took to make it all happen, those were not mistakes. I was starting to hit my stride in this particular tirade. If I'm feeling generous, the best I can do is call them consequences of your mistake, but we both know that consequences they are not. The crying had stopped, and I realized that I had her undivided attention. Because you mistakenly decided that this tawdry little affair would be all right, I continued, not daring to allow her even a moment to interject and potentially divert me from my course. You've put me in the position of having to realize that my wife respects neither me nor the vows we made when we married. Her eyes were now wide. Was it possible she was actually hearing what I said? So why aren't your actions consequences? I posed. Simply put, each time you made your plans, you had to revisit your decision-making process to justify your actions. Time and again, you decided that I either wouldn't know, wouldn't leave, or would be able to be handled after the fact. That's the same mistake. Repeated how many times? Every email, every text, every phone call, and, of course, every time you screwed him. She was now rigid staring at me. I wasn't entirely certain she was breathing, but at this point I honestly didn't care one way or the other. If it's any consolation, I said, as I realized that I was entering the home stretch of my monologue, I, too, made a mistake. I mistakenly thought that you were smart enough to grasp the meaning of the pledge we made to each other on the day of our wedding. I also thought you weren't foolish enough to believe that there were exceptions to those promises. Alicia must have been breathing, as she wasn't turning blue or purple though the shade of ash and gray that was her current pallor truly wasn't doing her any favors. The beautiful thing about mistakes, Alicia, I concluded, is that we are able to learn from them and hopefully in such a way that we won't repeat them in the future. I know I have, and now I bid you adieu. With that, I picked up my suitcases, closed the front door, and made my way into my continuing life. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.